Good morning. Can you guys hear me? Can you hear me? Yes. How about now? I will speak up and try to be in the mic. We're inside. Welcome. Yay. Yay. I missed my Pope, my Pope glass. I'm, I'm so glad to be back. I, I would like to keep it even just for myself after the restrictions are lifted. It makes me feel important. <laughs> um, I want to welcome you all to the worship service of First Congregational Church, St. Albans, United Church of Christ. My name is the Reverend Jessica Moore, and I am joined by Stefan Conradi, our organist this morning and every morning and Erin Granger, our music director, Lane McElry, our videographer, and all the deacons and folks that join us here, thank you for coming. First Congregational Church is an open and affirming church in the United Church of Christ. We are welcoming community of believers, seekers, and doubters, and please know that no matter where you are on life's journey, you're welcome here to travel with us. As a reminder, in the order of service, uh, we are singing our hymns all together outside this morning. So after the postlude, we'll go outside, and if you want to sing, join us on the steps, and we'll all join there. And I believe that we have a special announcement from Sandy, our head deacon. Good morning, everybody. Welcome back inside. <laughs> Good to see everybody today. Uh, so the deacons had just a, wanted to give everybody a special thank you uh, to a couple special people here. So uh, a special thank you to Mara and Stephen for all the great lawn mowing that they've done outside. And this is a huge yard that we have. So thank you so much for all the lawn mowing you guys have done over there. And also a big thank you to Jesse Hancock, Lane McAllery, and Greg Beeman for getting the church-wide Wi-Fi going. That has been a long, ongoing project, and thank you so much for getting it completed because I know it was a really, really big job. Uh, also, uh, Jesse fixed our last problem this week. Extra special thank you. Um, and John Relay, thank you for the delicious homemade communion sets that you all picked up that uh, he put together. Thank you so much. I know we're going to miss that little piece of cardboard that we were eating every <laughs> Sunday, but I think this is going to be much better. And so everybody, thank you so much for everything you've been doing. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> I know I think this morning we're all going to be just waiting for communion to break into our little scones and juice. Would you please join me for this morning's morning prayer in unison. O oh, Holy One, you have created us and placed us in community, complicated, fallible, searching, Open your words of life for us today as we gather to hear your gospel and sing your praises. Show us the way to justice and peace that we may follow you joyfully into the future you hope for our world. In Jesus' name, amen. And if you would join me for this morning's prayer of confession, also in unison. When we forget that God's ways lead all to the blessings of justice and mercy, God have mercy on us. When we forget that God's ways lead all, especially the most vulnerable, to blessings of safety, health, meaningful work, God have mercy on us. When we forget that God's way lead all to the blessings of shared abundance of God's beloved creation, God have mercy on us. Amen.
We all have good days and we all have bad days. We all have times when we strike it out of the park and times when we just make mistake after mistake. But no matter what kind of day you're having, no matter what mistake you've made, no matter how you've fallen, please know that God loves you without condition today, tomorrow, and every day. Amen. This morning, um, in the interest of time, I'm just going to read the Samuel passage. And I'm reading uh, 1 Samuel chapter 8, 4 through, actually we'll do 1 through 20. When Samuel became old, he made his sons judges over Israel. The name of his firstborn son was Joel, and the name of his second, Abijah. They were judges in Beersheba, yet his sons did not follow in his ways, but turned aside after gain. They took bribes and perverted justice. Then all the elders of Israel gathered together and came to Samuel at Ramah and said to him, You are old, and your sons do not follow in your ways. Appoint for us then a king to govern us, like other nations. But this displeased Samuel when they said, Give us a king to govern us. Samuel prayed to the Lord, and the Lord said to Samuel, Listen to the voice of your people and all that they have said to you. For they have not rejected you, but they have rejected me from being king over them, just as they have done to me from the day I brought them out of Egypt to this day, forsaking me and serving other gods, so also they are doing to you. Now then, listen to their voice, only you shall solemnly warn them, 
and show them the ways of the king who shall reign over them. So Samuel reported all the words the Lord of the Lord to the people who were asking him for a king. He said, These will be the ways of the king who will reign over you. He will take your sons and appoint them to his chariots and to be his horsemen and to run before his chariots. He will appoint for himself commanders of thousands and commanders of fifties and some to plow his ground and reap the harvest and make his implements of war and equip his chariots. He will take your daughters to be perfumers and cooks and bakers. He will take the best of your fields and vineyards and olive orchards and give them to his courtiers. He will take one-tenth of your grain and your vineyards and give it to his officers and courtiers. He will take your male and female slaves and the best of your cattle and donkeys and put them to his work. He will take one-tenth of your flocks, and he, you shall be his slaves. And in the day, you will cry out because of your king, whom you have chosen yourselves. The Lord will not answer you in that day. But the people refused to listen to the voice of Samuel. They said, no, but we are determined to have a king over us so that we may also be like other nations, and that our king may govern us and go before us and fight our battles. So ends this morning's reading. May these words, may God add to these words a blessing of understanding. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable to you, O God, my strength and my redeemer. This morning's reading from 1 Samuel is timely. I suspect it was, is, and will always be a timely reading. I'm happy with how things are going, the people demand change, grasping for a quick solution, not fully aware, not aware at all, of the potential pitfall, pitfalls and consequences. Not even after the ominous warning Samuel has given them. I read a reflection this week in the Christian Century by a Lutheran pastor named Joanne Post. In it, she described a beloved parishioner who, upon receiving a terminal diagnosis, turned to an experimental treatment that promised not the potential for a cure, but just precious more time. The list of side effects was long and they were severe. She ignored them and her doctors advised and jumped headlong into the new treatment. Pastor Post explains that her parishioner did not read the small print. And I wonder who would in her situation. Pastor Post goes on to talk about all the places in our lives where we will click, click, click over online user agreements, rarely reading the small print, eyes on the immediate prize, looking for instant gratification or trying to solve an immediate crisis or need. Who can't understand Pastor Post's parishioner? Who wouldn't risk everything for the potential of more time in her situation? It's so easy to commiserate and feel her desperation. But what about the elders in today's reading? And to see that and to understand where they're coming from, we need a little background on Samuel and the world in which he lived. Samuel was the last of the judges. Once the Israelites were in the land, they governed themselves with the aid of judges who were appointed by God. They were prophets. The book of Samuel documents the transition of governance from judges to kings. Samuel himself was special, not just that he was the last judge. The book opens with the story of his birth, which follows the pattern of so many birth special birth narratives in the Hebrew scriptures. His mother, Hannah, was barren. 
And more than anything, she wanted a son. So she goes to the temple where Eli was a priest, and she presents herself to God. O oh Lord of hosts, she prays, if only you will look upon the suffering of your maidservant. Will you give your maidservant a male child? I will dedicate him to the Lord for the days of his life. She says this prayer silently, and the priest Eli thinks she's drunk because he sees her mouth moving, but she's not saying anything out loud. And he tells her, sober up. She pleads with him, I'm not drunk. I'm miserable, unhappy, unfulfilled. I've been pouring out my heart to God in great anguish. Eli hears her, and he says, please go in peace. May the God of Israel grant you what you have asked of him. And so Samuel was born. And as a young child, Hannah brought him back to the temple to live with Eli and to serve God. When Samuel was still young, he was asleep one night in the temple. And he heard someone call, Samuel, Samuel. And he runs to Eli and he says, here I am, you called me? Awakened, Eli says, I didn't call you, go back to sleep. So Samuel goes back to sleep. And again he hears, Samuel, Samuel. And again, Samuel runs to Eli. I'm right here, you call? This happens another time. So three times total, Samuel hears, his voice, hears a voice calling his name. Eli, on the third time, realizes that it's God calling. So he says to Samuel, if you hear the voice again, answer, speak, your servant is listening. And it was God. And so Samuel is called by God to prophetic service. And over time, he becomes known as a trustworthy prophet of God. He serves the people. The people love him. And he will serve as a judge until he dies. And he will see Israel through the transition from judges to kings, anointing their first two. In his lifetime, Samuel will witness and be a part of that great sea change. Why did the Israelites want a king if they loved Samuel so much? Well, Samuel had two sons, and they judged, and he appointed them to be judges, and they judged at Beersheba. However, they were corrupt. They did not follow his ways. They were bent on gain. They accepted bribes, and they subverted justice. Which is interesting because Eli's own sons were corrupt. But Eli pleaded with his sons. They didn't listen to him. Indeed, when Samuel was called by God, God declared that he would sentence Eli's house to endless punishment for the iniquity. For Eli knew about what his sons were doing, and they committed sacrilege at will. Samuel's predictions were eventually fulfilled. However, although Samuel's sons are corrupt, he still allows them to continue to judge. And the people are understandably uncomfortable. They're worried. The elders can see how things are going and how things will progress if change isn't made. I can, I can imagine being an elder at that time, seeing this disaster unfolding. What do you do? Well, you know, you know the system you're coming from, that the judges. It's a theocracy mediated by the judges. And you can see other nations and other systems around you. Those were kingdoms. So it could seem that this is your choice. You have a judge or you have a king. Do you stay the course, which has worked in the past but is now failing? Or do you change and move to a monarchy? So that's what they decided to do. They asked Samuel to ask God to appoint them a king so that they can be like other nations. And that doesn't please Samuel, and it doesn't please God. And God gives Samuel this long list of warnings 
for Samuel to give to the people about the king, being a king, having a king. They don't listen. And it's hard not to go back to that sort of pharmaceutical image in your head. Those, you know, the TV commercials, the intense primary colors, the surreal, very happy people doing very happy things that no one really does. And that pleasant, mellow voice listing the side effects, including death. Just give us a king. It will be great. And at the end of the warning, Samuel tells them that God said, the day will come when you cry out because of your king, whom you, you yourselves have chosen, and the Lord will not answer you on that day. Apparently, God was hurt. And as God said, like everything else they have ever done since I brought them out of Egypt to this day, forsaking me and worshiping other gods, Really, so much of the Hebrew scriptures are about people's resistance to God. I'm reminded about how the people complained to Moses in the desert after having been liberated from slavery in Egypt. You've brought us into the wilderness to die, they said. We should have stayed behind. At least there we would have known where our next meal was coming from. This complaint and request by the elders for a king to me, seems sort of par for the course. So why does God now say their cries will be unanswered? Sue, in our Bible study, suggested that God was frustrated, like a parent. This is the last time I'm helping you out. Next time you're on your own. I think we've all been on one side or the other, if not both, of that conversation. All the while knowing you'd be there for them all the while the child knowing that you'd be there for them. Sometimes uh, when we read a passage like this, we take certain things for granted within the context of the narrative story. For instance, that what Samuel reports back to the people is exactly what God said to him. It kind of makes you wonder how much how much of what Samuel communicates to the people is from God, and how much is from Samuel? You really have to wonder sometimes when someone says God said such and such. When people believe that, that puts you in a really powerful position. And I imagine it would be pretty tempting to make additions, little subtractions, a little added emphasis, for your own perspective. The Reverend Dr. Cheryl Lindsay, who writes biblical commentaries for the United Church of Christ, wonders about that. And in particular, when Samuel says, the day will come when you cry out because of your king, and the Lord will not answer you on that day. Was it God? Or was it Samuel? After all, think about poor Samuel. He puts his children in positions of power, setting up a family succession, which according to Dr. Lindsay was not an assumed right for prophets or judges. Family succession is an assumed right for monarchies. So Samuel passes the baton to his children. Is he hoping to create a dynasty? Is he hoping to help his kids? His motivation is really not clear. What is clear that his sons are corrupt and that the people of Israel don't trust them. So that so much so that they demand immediate radical change. And therefore Samuel feels rejected by the people. He's sort of hurt. It bruises his ego. And he lashes out the harsh judgment. God will not hear your cries. Samuel doesn't seem able to empathize empathize with the children of Israel. He also doesn't try to create a creative solution with them. And we've all done that when we're hurt, to some extent or another. Ego grew, Samuel's small self cries out in pain. He's like a child who takes his ball and goes home because things aren't going his way. 
When I was a teenager, I had a friend who would sort of present to you sort of nice gifts. And they wouldn't necessarily be something that you wanted, but it was so well-meaning and, and you really appreciated it that you would take them. And then she would get mad at you. And she was really sensitive and easily hurt. It was actually hard to figure out what would set her off, but something would, and she would demand the gift back. I was too young to do anything but be bewildered. And I was too young to ask her why she felt so bad so much of the time, and really I was far too young to offer her any kind of solace in her pain. We've been talking a lot about communication recently, how it's important for everyone's voice to be heard, and how we need to be able to hear different and opposing viewpoints. Open lines of communication are how we create a strong and loving community. The people love Samuel. That is clear from the text. By lashing out and bittered and resentful, he creates division and more uncertainty. Their love and trust were answered with condemnation. I think Samuel lost an opportunity to help create a better, stronger community. It would have been uncomfortable. It would have required his vulnerability and honesty. It would have required trust in God and in his community. It's so easy to do what Samuel did. And we need really to get beyond the point of being controlled by seeming personal affronts that make our small self cry out in pain. When we're open and honest, when we allow ourselves to be vulnerable, when we trust in the love of God and each other, there is the opportunity for growth the opportunity for creative, positive change, create a stronger community and a better world. Amen. God be with you. Lift up your hearts. Give thanks to God. We remember that on the night of betrayal and desertion, and on the eve of his death, Jesus gathered his disciples for the Passover meal. He took the bread. And after giving thanks to you, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body, broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In a similar manner, he took the wine and the cup. And after supper, he said, Drink this, all of you. This is the blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for many, for the forgiveness of sins. 
Do this as often as you drink in remembrance of me. This morning we have these lovely communion packets. I invite you to open them now. Dip the scone in the grape juice and you'll want seconds. And while we're pausing for a moment here, I want to remind you that our communion offering this month is for the Williamstown Church, United Church of Christ, that had a devastating fire and they lost their entire building. I work with their Christian ed person on um, a faith formation board and it happened the week of our big conference and I can tell you how upsetting it was to the congregation and I really appreciate Mission Board for remembering them this month. of Christ, the body and spirit, keep and preserve you everlasting life. Let us pray. Thank you, most holy God, for meeting us in this simple meal. May your presence within us ripple beyond us, ever expanding, until the day when you gather all your saints from the four winds to share in your eternal banquet. Amen. now moving into joys and concerns and I want to just remind people that we do record this it is broadcast so if you do share something keep it a little bit general any joys or concerns this morning soup Ladies Supper, I mean breakfast, Maple City Diner, June 12th, call soup. I went last week, last month, and it was great. I ate and it lasted me all day. <laughs> Anything else? Park.
Yeah. Really great to be back in the church. It's it's sacred space. It's it's important. Paula. more than twice. <laughs> I love the, uh, if you didn't hear, Paula was talking about the, the lovely video that the BFA chorus uh, put together. Uh, they asked, uh, they were in touch with Erin and asked if they could use our sanctuary to do an end of the year recording. And we said, of course, yes. And they had the kids in, they were distance and masked, and they sounded fabulous. And they had, um, I guess they must have had a drone or something, and they did this beautiful aerial photography of the church. It really was spectacular. And um, it's on our Facebook page, so please uh, check it out. And any other joys, concerns? I have a joy that, um, that John brought his delicious communion uh, kits, sets with him today. It's, uh, it really makes a big difference having loving hands prepare that. It, it's so different from eating the cardboard that we're used to. <laughs> I feel that I had another joy and I have forgotten it. Forgive me. Please join me in the spirit of prayer. Gracious God, wonderful creator, let us rejoice in your creation, surrounded by your creation each and every day in each other. We feel the Holy Spirit moving. May we be reminded that you are always near, O oh God of peace. As many of us revel in the long days and long evenings of early summer, relaxing, playing, delighting in the splendor in which we are surrounded and enmeshed, let us be mindful of those whose season of suffering seems to have no end. Illness, loss, depression, loneliness, feeling isolated from others and from you. Help us to reach out to you with love. Help us to reach out through your love to each other, nurturing, caring, and loving each other as you nurture, care, and love us. Delighting in you and each other this season and every season, for it is in love that we blossom. If you would join me for the prayer that Jesus taught his disciples. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
As you go out this week, remember to breathe deeply, pause frequently, and love extravagantly. Amen.